Um, and I'm Will. I'm also a Stern alumni in 2000. Um, and uh, here to be your host for the evening and help you guys grill Walter. So if you guys have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. We're going to try to keep this a little bit more casual um, and uh, to really find out who Walter Tom is. <laughs> so uh, let's just kick it off by showing uh, who are students um, here tonight. Raise your hand. And other uh, alumni. Okay. And uh, family members. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yes. Um, okay. So uh, is your mic on? Yep, it is. Okay. So um, why don't we start off by uh, kind of just giving or let Walter, uh, Walter have, give us a little background about yourself, um, such as, you know, your, where you were born and uh, where you went to school and your experiences. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Will, and good evening, everyone. I think I've met some of you uh, before. Uh, actually, my mentee is also there, my wife is there, my daughter is there, too. So uh, thank you, Wei for uh, organizing this event. Uh, and, and Will, thanks so much for, for helping out. Uh, well, I'm Walter, and, and when I first got the uh, invitation from, from Wei Xing, I, I got so excited, very excited, because I always believe that uh, NYU changed my life. It really changed everything about me, and, and I always wanted to have the opportunity to, to contribute back, to give back to, to NYU in many different ways. Uh, and as to Will, your question, who am I, my background? Uh, well, uh, you can tell by my accent where I'm from. Anybody wants to take a guess where I was born? Where are guests? <laughs> Free pizza. <laughs> uh, very strong Hong Kong accent, right? <laughs> so I, I was born in Hong Kong. Uh, let me, well, my age, I think, is already disclosed by uh, year of, you know, I got, okay, so I was, I was born in Hong Kong, and um, when I was young, my whole family uh, migrated to, to the US. And don't ask me why. At that time, we just followed my parents. And we went to New York City. At that time, we went to New York City, and I was um, 17 years old. Uh, then went to high school, finished high school in New York. Then it was time to apply for university. And being in New York, first school come to mind, of course, is NYU. Of course, there are Columbia and others. Uh, and I felt that NYU was a, a good, very good school, so I applied. I applied to NYU. Um, then study accounting. I had two majors, accounting and economics. I did two majors. Um, I graduated in 1989. Many of you may not have been born by then <laughs> at that time. And then I started working for an accounting firm, a public accounting firm. At that time, Mark would know. I think Mark is probably the only person who, who, who knows what, what are the big eight accounting firms. <laughs> now there's only big four. Right, the big four, the Sida crisis is so now it's the big four firms. At that time, it was big eight. Uh, so I joined one of the big eight accounting firms. The, the firm does not exist today. Uh, it's called Arthur Anderson. Um, I, then I worked there for four years, four or five years. And I then did something that changed my life again. I applied to my boss to come to China. Like with what, what, just so we get perspective, what year was this when you came to China? 1993. Wow. wow. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so I, 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 I told my boss, I asked, hey, I want, to come, I want to come to Asia, Hong Kong, China. And my boss at that time said, okay, you can go to China. Then I said, wait, well, I'm from Hong Kong. How about sending me to Hong Kong? I know the, I don't, I don't know anything about China at that time. And, uh, at that time, Hong Kong was not a part of China. Now Hong Kong is part of China. So, but my boss at that time said, you can go to Hong Kong anytime, and, and I can always have a job there for you. But Hong Kong doesn't need you. Hong Kong already established a mature practice. We need you in China. We need you in Shanghai. That's what he told me. And I said, well, I don't know Mandarin. I've never been to Shanghai but I'll give it a try. So that's how I came to China to work in 1993 without knowing that I would stay until today. 
Wow, so you've pretty much been here ever since. That's you must have, right. have uh, seen lots of tremendous amount of change. But before we get to that, I think, um, I think personally for me, a uh, question that I'd like to ask you is that, how was your experience being, I think, you know, as a 17-year-old moving, that's kind of a, already a relatively late, uh, I myself, I immigrated to the U.S. when I was 10. So uh, how was that experience? Because I think that may apply to, you know, certain students here, seeing that, you know, they grew up in China, but now this is probably as Western of an experience as um, in their lives, um, you know, for the first time. And so kind of like you to share, how was that? Um, Transition. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Will. Uh, it was. Um, it wasn't easy in the beginning. It wasn't easy in the beginning because growing up in Hong Kong, although we knew the language English, we never really had to use it on a daily basis. We never really had to speak it. Well, you guys were also speaking British English. Right. Well, yeah. Speak English. <laughs> you know everything. So in the beginning, well, it was quite tough, right? Particularly going to school, going to high school, no friends. Right, uh, zero friends. Really had to start from the beginning. Uh, but then, you know, I think New York City, like NYU, is famous for diversity and inclusiveness. New York is a very inclusive city, and the NYU as well. So it wasn't very hard then to start to get adjusted okay. to their life. Okay, that's great. Um, and then uh, also, what made you? Uh, you know, what was the one thing that kind of stood out for you for uh, for choosing NYU? Um, well, I really, I, I wasn't really thinking that that much. Uh, in the because we live in the city, right? We live in the city. I wanted to go to a school that is uh, I could still live, live at home, right? I could still live at home. Uh, at that time, we were living in. And for those of you who know New York City, there was a place called Queens. And there was a place called Flushing. <laughs> I think the alumni would know. Uh, and Flushing is mainly Chinese and Korean immigrants live, and that's where we live. So I wanted to save money, right? So, uh, but I didn't want to go to a city university. I didn't want to go to a state university. I wanted to go to a private university, which hopefully can give me a better, a better future. So that's how I chose NYU. Uh, I, I applied. They gave me a pretty good scholarship. Um, I was on my own, I, I don't have enough money, so I, I borrow money from the government. I think more for the older people you you know you know how that how that's like. So the government will lend us money to pay for the tuition. And after I graduated, that I paid back to the government. So that's how I chose NYU. And then you were for a few years before coming back to NYU for your idea. That's right. Well that's why. Right. So I, I after I graduated uh, I, I needed to work because I didn't really come from a rich family, so I needed to get a job. So uh, that's one of the, another one of the reasons why I chose accounting. For those of you who chose account accounting, relatively straightforward in terms of finding a job. There were at that time there were eight public accounting firms called the Big Eight. So you know uh, the chance of getting one offer from the Big Eight is pretty good at that time. So that's how I told the county. Then after I graduated, I, I needed to I needed to get a job. I needed to make money and pay back pay back my tuition. So that's that's what happened. I, I, I started working for Arthur Anderson, and uh, Arthur Anderson, which is the company I used to work for, had a program which they would pay for MBA tuition. They would pay for my MBA tuition. Uh, so after. I say after two years, after two years working full time, I then applied for for, uh, for the tuition program, and I got got approved. Then I went back to NYU to get my MBA, uh, and I finally graduated. I got my MBA in 1993. So I think that you were very, very kind of um, practical when we were at Provo. Right? <laughs> so I think accountants are very practical. Well, uh, and sometimes creative. <laughs> Um, I think a question that I think uh, poses an interesting question, since we're also both mentors um, in the kind of the mentor program, is that you know recently there's not a, not really a debate, but sort of like a discussion as to whether people encourage kids to follow their passion or or kind of be a little bit more practical. Um, you know, the, the famous speech by Steve Jobs is you know passion or 
bust, right? But I think, um, I don't know, what, what do you feel about that statement? Okay, well, uh, maybe I'm an old school guy, right? <laughs> Uh, of course, following passion is, is number one, right? You have to do what you like to do. If you are put into a situation to do something you don't have, you don't have any passion for, uh, it would not work. So I think hopefully, uh, hopefully, hopefully the passion route is also the practical route. Because I also have seen many people that who have followed their passion, but at the end, really going nowhere. Couldn't find a job. Uh, try, try this and try that, at the end nothing really works out. So I think my advice is know what you want, know your passion, but at the same time think longer, think, think longer. Okay, if I, if I do this, what will happen? If I do that, what are my options? At the end you have to bring it back to one thing that is uh, to make a living and, and contribute back to the society. I think at the end, you need, you need to contribute back to the society one way or the other. Okay, and also, um, no, I completely agree with that, um, first of all. Um, uh, but in terms of being, having been in China for so long, what are uh, some of the key changes that, that you think have happened, and also perhaps some of the um, key things for kind of young people, um, the kind of key trends that you, you see uh, that China developing, um, kind of you know going forward. Yes. Uh, yep. Yeah, I've lived in Shanghai for now 23 years, and mainly for those of you who were around at that time, this this plan was nothing, right? Pudong. I still remember. I still remember standing at the bun at the bun uh, on the pushy side looking across the river. The only building stood up was the um, the TV tower. Okay. The TV tower. That was the only building that existed in Pudong. So the kind of changes that has happened in the last 20 plus years in China, in Shanghai has been tremendous and has been amazing. And that's why many people like myself have decided to stay in China and build a career in China. Um, and I have to give credit to the Shanghai government and of course the Chinese government as well, but in particular, the Shanghai government is very forward-looking. The Shanghai government did a, did a few things that I have, I'm very impressed. And, and for, i give you some example. Well, the, first, the first thing the Shanghai government did was, maybe you would know, many of you would not know, is uh, in order to encourage people to buy property, you get tax refund. Any one of you heard of that? In Chinese, it's called Go Fang Tui Shui. So you would know. <laughs> it was more than 10 years ago now. It was when the time the Shanghai government wanted to, to boost up the real estate sector. It was, it was very cheap at that time. So the government said, if you buy property, let's say a million RMB, and if you have paid income tax, your personal income tax on a million, they give you all back. They give you all back. It was an amazing policy. No one could have believed it. I didn't believe it when I saw it. I've never seen any government in the world to do that. And Shanghai was the, I would say it was the first city in China who have done that. And look at the result. The result is the whole, the whole real estate sector had been driven. Uh, and it also, it also led to many, many sectors who have developed. Uh, that's the one thing. I'll give you one more example. Uh, Pudo development. Um, I remember when I first came to China, when I first came to Shanghai, if you want to come from Pudong to Shanghai, to, from Pusi to Pudong, you have to pay a toll. You have to pay a taxi, you take a taxi, right? You, the taxi coming out of the tunnel, there were toll gate that you pay 15 RMB for the taxi to go to arrive to Long. So that's fine, right? Coming from New York, coming from Hong Kong, paying a toll is normal. And one day, one day, I took a taxi to Pudong. Boom, it just went through. The toll, the, the toll gate disappeared. I was thinking, what happened? No government, I, at least based on what I have seen, would have done that. Later on, I found out the reason, and the reason is because they wanted to develop Pudong. They wanted people to come to Pudong 
So one of the one of the ways to do that is to get rid of the charge right? and look at what Pudong is today. So I think it was another very brave, successful policy that the Shanghai government uh, introduced. And so you, yeah. most of that 20 some odd year you've been in Shanghai. That's right. That's right. And then, so, I mean, you know, I think most of us know that Shanghai is probably kind of at the spearhead of development in, in China. Um, but how did, um, you know, like compared to kind of the eternal debate between Beijing, Shanghai, Beijing, Shanghai, you know, what are, have, have some of the things that you've seen the China, uh, Shanghai government that have implemented, um, have they been kind of, uh, kind of learn and copy elsewhere in China? Yes, yes, Will. Um, and also, um, i give you an example. A part of what I do, actually, I work for Ernst & Young, as you know, uh, but I spent a lot of my time supporting the government. I spent a lot of my time helping the government, advising the government. Uh, and because of that, I, I'm very lucky that the government actually gave me an award, uh, the, the Magnolia Award last year uh, by Yunnan Jiang. Uh, so I, I've been doing a lot of things for the government, and, and one project that I think I helped the government, and, and the government has been very successful for Shanghai, uh, is called uh, Regional Headquarter. Uh, in Chinese, it's called Di Chu Zhong Bo. So at that time, probably 10 plus years ago now, Shanghai wanted to attract more foreign companies to establish their headquarter in Shanghai. So they wanted to know how to do it. And, and of course then, you know, at that time it was still up for Anderson. Got involved. So what I had done for them at that time was I analyzed for them what other cities around the world have been doing to attract headquarter companies to come to Shanghai. I show them the rules of Singapore. And many of you know Singapore has been a very successful place for regional headquarters. Hong Kong, Tokyo, New York, London. And then based on that, let's create the China rule. Let's create the Shanghai rule. Uh, tax rates, for example. How do you use tax rates to attract foreign companies to come to China? How do you build the infrastructure around it? If foreign companies bring their headquarters here, many expatriates will have to come, right? Do we have the infrastructure to, to support that? So, so um, I think that project has been extremely successful as of today. Uh, if I remember the number correctly, there are about 500 uh, foreign companies who have already Establish a headquarter in Shanghai. I'm oh, getting more. Okay, and then also because a lot of the work uh, kind of from your uh, bio, also you also help company Chinese company kind of go out of, of China. Can you speak a little bit um, about that as well? Okay. Uh, yeah. So I would I would if I look at my 20 plus career as a consultant in China, I would I would divide that in two stages. The first stage had been bringing foreign capital into China. That's all I did for the first 10, 15 years. Companies like like Dow, companies like uh, Coca-Cola, McDonald, GE, GM, General Motors, uh, BMW, all the foreign companies, how they should invest in China. What are the rules? What are the regulations and what are the, the opportunities? So that was my first half of my career. And if, to use Chinese, is Li Jing Lai, bring in the foreign capital. But the world has changed. China has changed. I'm now into my second phase of my career, which is helping Chinese companies expand overseas. And in Chinese, I would use the words jump to to. You can see jump to to. I'll give you a quiz. Uh, I'll give you, uh, if you look at it, if you look at any, um, you know the Fortune 500 company list, the largest 500 companies of the world, we call Fortune 500. Maybe anyone want to take a guess how many of those companies are Chinese companies? If you look at the Fortune 500 company, the largest, the biggest 500 companies of the world, 
how many? 50? 50. 110. Wow. 110. Yep. And that number exceeded Japan. Of course. Number one is the US, right? The U US company represented the most on that list. It used to be Japan, being second, but now it's China. So Chinese companies today are very big, very big. And they are expanding their global footprint. So to answer Will's question, that is basically all I do now. I don't have, my, personally, I don't have any more foreign company clients. All my clients are Chinese companies. They are much more demanding, right? They are much more difficult to serve. They don't know how to use advisors. They don't know how to use consultants, but they need to use consultants. Because if they if they want to, if they want to buy a company in, in the UK, they cannot go to the, the Chinese CPA firm. The Chinese CPA firm cannot help them. They have to use one of the big four accounting firms, but they don't know how to use it. So but that is but it's at the same time very exciting and very rewarding. Right. Uh, because I get to work with the CEO, the CFO, or the C suite people. They have quarter lead in China. I get to work with them directly. So would that be kind of for like for the students here? Is that kind of the greater trend that for them, you know, being shared and having that bold culture, would that be more something that um, perhaps more opportunities in, in that direction? I think so. Definitely, definitely. Uh, because you know, one one of the things that I I I, I was gonna sh uh, share with you is after you graduate. What kind of job, what kind of company you want to work for, right? What kind of company you want to work for, what kind of job you want to do. Uh, in my days, it was very easy, right? Of course, the foreign companies. The foreign companies are bigger, and they are high paid, they pay a lot of money, opportunities, international common. I think now, opportunities are even more and not limited to foreign companies. Chinese companies are very big, very strong, and Chinese companies, there are two types. The state-owned, in Chinese it's called guoxi, and the privately held, means right? they are very different, they are very different. Uh, guoxi will be like uh, the three buckets of oil, but we call it three buckets of oil. Those are the big oil and gas companies in Beijing. In Shanghai, we also have many guoxi state-owned companies. In Shanghai, it will be like uh, Bao Gang, Bao Steel, would be like Shanghai Auto, Shangxi, Shanghai Electric, Shanghai uh, Qi. These are state-owned companies. They are expanding internationally. They need foreign experts. They need people who understand Western culture to work for them. And then there are the privately held companies, and of course the famous ones will be Huawei, uh, Alibaba uh, and others, uh, BAT, uh, the BAT of the world. Uh, BAT T is Baidu, A is Ali, T is Tanshu, uh, BAT of the world. And so they offer very attractive packages. I think they come to the universities to recruit. I'm not sure whether they come to this university to recruit. Uh, maybe they do, and they should if they don't. Uh, and let me know, I'll ask them to, because we come to this university to recruit. I think we were here last week. <laughs> EY was here last week to do recruitment talk. Um, and they, they're hiring people, and they pay very well. So Will, you're right, I think they have many more options than we used to, I used to have. <laughs> No, and then also, uh, no, I mean, we, we deal with BAT, uh, uh, you know, in the media business, and their footprints are just all over the place. Yeah. Um, and then, well, let's switch, switch gears a little bit here. Um, so, obviously, you would have uh, very long working hours, you know, hard work and whatnot. Let's talk about a little bit about, you know, work-life balance. Um, and then we have your family here to verify whether what you're saying is the truth or not. Um, how do you kind of keep yourself, um, you know, from stress and whatnot? And I'm, I'm sure this applies to students too with academic. Now, how do you keep yourself sane? You know, do you have hobbies and things that you do that 
Yeah, well, yeah, I think I do have hobbies. Uh, I, I like, uh, on the weekend, uh, I travel a lot, and my wife, my daughter, they know what they know it, and I feel guilty about it. I think this year I am on a plane a hundred times already. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, every week I'm, I'm somewhere, so it's very hard to balance work life, particularly working for an accounting firm. Uh, let me be really honest. For those of you who have applied, be psychologically prepared. It's a lot of hours, uh, but that's but it's fun. It's fun. Uh, I tell you a story, right? Well, I tell you a story. I, I remember I, I was um, I was a partner, and then one day I, I came to the office. I received a letter. Someone wrote me a letter. Right? I opened the letter. It was written by the mother of one of one of my staff. <laughs> so her mother wrote me a letter. So I looked at the letter. Of course, if she wrote in Chinese, basically it says, Who are you guys? How come my daughter's never home? What, 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 what are you doing? What is your firm doing? How come I never see my daughter anymore? Because she was working very long hours. But she was doing a great job. An outstanding professional in my firm. Probably Mark would have had similar experience as well. <laughs> then I then I said, wow, then I then I, of course I did, I did not tell her, I did not tell the staff that her mother had wrote a letter. What I did was I just told people around her to reschedule her work. Right. And try to reschedule her work. But she was very enjoying the work because you do good work, then you get rewarded. The best way, the best reward is when the boss or when the client, when the client tells you, hey Will, you've done a great job. Thank you very much. You've saved me 20 million dollars in taxes. By the way, we don't work for Donald Trump, okay? <laughs> it's the most fulfilling, rewarding feeling you can have. Then you don't mind working because people around you are working long hours. You don't feel like you should be going home. It's a, I know it's not, it's not good, it's bad actually, but that's the culture. That's people learn, that's how people learn. So to, just to finish the story, that lady was doing really well, she got promoted to manager. Five years later, she got promoted to manager, and after five years later, I showed her the letter, and she was crying. <laughs> but uh, just for example, that, um, so for me, uh, I, would, I would try not to travel on the weekend, to the best I can, I come home for the weekend and then my hobby will be, I like sports, I like all kinds of sports, I like watching sports. So, but I participated in a couple of sports, I played golf. A lot of people don't consider that as, as a sport. Uh, and I do some cycling, I like, I like cycling, yeah. Okay, well from a sound of it, so you work, and then for on your leisure time, you watch sports. And you play golf. <laughs> I don't see a lot of family involvement, <laughs> even in your leisure time there. <laughs> okay, stop now. <laughs> you're right, you're right. Well, my, do my daughter has grown up. Uh, she doesn't want to talk to me anymore. Uh, but I, recently, I, 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 found, uh, I found a common interest that we share. I uh, play guitar. So, so what kind? Uh, we play guitar. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's been, it's not easy. Uh, so there are many sacrifices and many choices that you have to make. The first choice you have already made already, NYU. Great choice, right? Oh. Second choice that you have made, or you, you haven't made, is the major. Right? So you will make the major. Whatever it is, it doesn't have to be finance. It doesn't have to be accounting. Right? It can be anything. Then the third choice. Uh, you will be making it when you graduate. Who do you want to work for? A multinational company, global footprint, or a small company? Start your own business. You have to make that choice. And my advice, well, if I may, my advice to them is: once you make that choice, try to stick to it. Don't give up too quickly. Uh, I've seen many people, many many people, join Ernst and Young. After two years, ah, oh, I don't like it, it's not what I expected, blah, 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 and then they changed, they left, joined another company, and then two years later, they joined another company, and at the end, going nowhere. Um, once you make your career choice, 
I, my advice to all my friends and people and all of you is try to stick to it and try to think positive about it. There must be a lot of good things about it that you haven't experienced and really spend the time and understand the company or understand the industry before you want to change. It's okay to change. In fact, there are many people who ended up leaving UI and now become alumni of UI, supporting UI uh, with still friends and, and, and business relationship. But my advice is to don't make that, don't make jump to that conclusion too quickly. Right, so I mean, like, kind of grind it out at least to yeah. really get to it because I don't think there is a perfect situation. Um, nothing, no situation is perfect in that regard. But um, but what about in terms of, or particularly for the students here, you know, how would you suggest them going about trying different things so that they kind of um, can be a major or even you know internships? Should they try to kind of? take different type of classes and or try different internship opportunities and, and to kind of find where they want to kind of grind for you know a period of time. Well definitely, definitely. Uh, you should try as many things as possible. Of course there are limited time, right? How many summers do you have? Maybe one or two that you can really turn. Have a I would say have a general idea of what you want to do, but and but and within that framework try different things. Internship is very important. It's very important. Internship is an opportunity for you to, to understand what the company really does. I mean, of course, you wouldn't be able to see a lot of it, but at least feel it out. Uh, so I would strongly encourage all of you to, to, uh, to do an internship, uh, at least for three, four weeks, or sometimes two weeks, two weeks would be too short. And welcome to UI. We, we offer many internship opportunities. Uh, and. Uh, yeah, I would, I would say just, just try out different things and, and, and talk to different people. I mean, I'm sure you have a, and I, in fact, just saw like a career counseling office, right? There was a career counseling office in the school. I, I received a lot of counseling when I was in NYU back in, back in the old days. Right? And I talked, I go to them, I, I ask them, hey, what should I do? What, what, which company is better? At the end, actually, I got. Out of the big eight accounting firms, I applied all eight of them. Um, I, I got four offers, right? I got four offers, and, and how should I choose? Why why offer Anderson and not KPMG? And why not PW, PWC? At that time, it was PW. And C was a different firm. <laughs> it was many mergers. So talk to people, ask around, uh, and then at the end, you have to make your own judgment. And, and make a decision, and once the decision is made, really stick to it. Really stick to it. You know what kind of people I envy the most? What kind of people I envy, I admire the most? You kind of think I'm old school. Yes, I'm old school. But I, I admire people who have only had one job throughout his life. One company. And that was my wish, actually. That was my wish. When I joined Arthur Anderson, I wish I could retire from Arthur Anderson. And I was doing very well. I, 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 thought, I, I thought I could actually make that happen until, until the day when <laughs> Arthur Anderson did something wrong in the US and the whole firm actually disappeared, collapsed. So unfortunately, I couldn't. <laughs> you know, I think you know there um, these entities, companies. Sometimes they're rather transient thing. But um, how about the kind of the people? You know, and the importance of. Um, I have never had a job where it didn't come from a referral. So, like, can you talk a little bit about kind of developing that? I think particularly for a student here, developing that network of not just professionally, but you know, the personal, the kind of support network that that's played. You know, the, the, the role that network has kind of played in your uh, career and, and, and your life. Yep. Thank you, Will. Uh, it's a great question, and it is that is so important. If, if I may name a couple, a few things that have made me successful, semi-successful, relationship. Building a relationship, maintaining a relationship is so key, particularly in China. But all this applies all over the world, but particularly in China, maintaining a network and building relationship with, with people around you. It can be your clients, it can be a government official, it can be universities. Right, I'm here to network with you. 
for my benefit. I'm learning from Will, I'm learning from Boy Singh, I'm learning from many of you. Uh, it is so important because you never know when you're going to need help. And the world is about relationship. Oh, yeah. Why? Why? Uh, Huawei happened to be my client. So, yeah, I spent a lot of time serving Huawei. That's why I travel so much. I go. <laughs> Huawei operates in 100 countries. <laughs> So I don't have to go to all the countries, but I do have to go to the major countries uh, to make sure that Huawei is properly served by UI. So, uh, wow, what was I going to say? Yeah, so why, my question is, why Huawei used Anthony Young? They could use PwC, they could use KPMG, right? In their mind, maybe we are the same. Right? iPhone, Samsung, the same. They are not. <laughs> but PwC, EUI, the same. Why they use me? It's, everything started off with awkward relationship. Right? Because I trust you, Will. I trust you. I know you will do good work for me. I know if I give you a project, you're going to finish it for me. I know if I ask you to finish tomorrow, you'll finish it tonight. It's that kind of trust and relationship that you build and you strengthen that make you successful in the future. So please build a network, and you are doing it already. By coming to this event, I think you are already taking a step to make friends, to build a network, which in the future you will use and you will help others. It's a mutual, it's a mutual relationship. Well, I think, you know, in your, uh, given your seniority and you know, you're probably in that kind of the give and take, I would assume that you're kind of giving a lot more. Um, and then you know, you're involving um, in kind of um, charities and kind of meaningful social services type of events. Um, could you uh, talk a little bit about some of those things that you've been involved in and what that has kind of um, kind of the importance of that of doing that sort of kind of giving back to communities and, and social? Yeah. So uh, yeah. Well, so I really. Didn't have, don't have a lot of time to do so much. I wanted to do more. Uh, so I, I, we, we always need to make choices and be selective for what you do. So I believe in working, I believe in helping the government. So I spent a lot of my time helping the government. And I, I, I just give you one, one example uh, of uh, how I helped the Shanghai government to come up with that policy of digital headquarters. I spent a my background is accounting and tax. I mean, I'm a tax partner, so so I have to work with tax bureaus around China. So I spend a lot of my time building a relationship with the tax bureau of Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, uh, and help them. Right? But how do I help them? What kind of help do they need? Well, they always want to understand what's going on around in other countries. Hey, how does the IRS, IRS is the U.S. tax bureau, right? How does the IRS manage this particular issue? How does the uh, London uh, HRM manage this particular issue? So, so my job is to, I go, and I don't know the answer. I don't know the answer either. But EUI has an answer. EUI is a global organization. There must be an answer exists. So I go to them, hey, I'll help you, let me help you. I get the answer, how do I get the answer? I call my, I call my New York partner. I happen to know 25 years ago. Now it's network again, right? It's relationship. And then I'm helping you, and in the future, if my client, let's say I have a client who needs help on a tax issue with that government official, he'll help me. So, so, so that's a lot of, Social thing I do. I do uh, of course, you know, uh, when I try to give back to the society, I, I will, uh, my company do a lot. Right? My company will, we have a lot of local computers. When we finish the local computers, um, they're still in good working right? order, we'll give them to, to the schools in, in the remote area. But what I really enjoy to do, and thank you, Wei for creating the opportunity, is to coming back to NYU and, and, and try to help the students. Yeah, like, like what you're doing. Because I think NYU really changed my life. Uh, if I hadn't gone to NYU and, and, and had that kind of experience, I wouldn't join 
the company I, I joined. I wouldn't come to China. I wouldn't have met my wife. I wouldn't be here tonight. So I'll always be grateful and, 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 and be Chinese is uh, called uh, uh, um, a little bit of Chinese. <laughs> um, and then also kind of just kind of uh, digging here a little bit. Um, a lot of, I'm sure in your work dealing with kind of multicultural, uh, I don't want to say conflict differences, right? Like in terms of, like how do you, you know, from a, a being a multicultural person, how do you usually resolve that um, when, when those kind of sensitivities come up? Because I mean, I'm thinking, when the, some of these students go out into the world, that's something that they will encounter. And they are in such a great place to be able to be that kind of that lubricant and that bridge between the, the two cultures. I mean, what are some of the perhaps, you know, obstacles that you kind of encounter in your work during when it comes to multicultural issues and, and how is that kind of you know, resolved? Okay, uh, thank you, Will. Yeah, I think, uh, I think first of all, you're right. I think we are all very lucky. We are all very lucky that we are here in China. We are all we are here in Shanghai, not just China. Right? China is so big. We are very lucky, we are very grateful, and the experience that you all have will benefit you for the rest of your life. The, the, the American culture, the Chinese culture, uh, and you like will. I think in the future, when they when you go out work for whatever companies you work for, you will be dealing with multicultural conflicts. I think, I think um, there's really no secret formula. I think the, the way I, I handle it is I always, I always do my homework. <laughs> do, always do your homework, right? Who are you talking to? Who is this person? It's German guy, right? This guy's a German guy, straightforward, no joke. Right, get it done. Okay. That's, that's, how I, that's how I would interact with him. Uh, a Japanese guy. You can have a meeting, but you don't know what the conclusion is after the meeting. The conclusion happened when? At the dinner. <laughs> Over the drink. That's when they would let you know what they really think. Okay, and you know you're dealing with Japanese culture, and then the US culture, and you know, the, the, the British culture. The French, right? The Taiwanese, right? Taiwanese? I know you're from Taiwan. <laughs> they were probably a little bit more American than Taiwanese. Very Taiwanese. Taiwanese are very my experience doing business with Taiwanese companies. Of course, I'm, I'm being stereotyped and generalized, and if I, if I uh, say something wrong, uh, excuse me, but Taiwanese companies are very tough on negotiation. Very tough, right? $50? No, $49. No, 50. 49. Very tough. Okay, done deal. Shake hand. Then the Taiwanese company will treat me to dinner and buy me a $50 dinner. <laughs> <laughs> they gave you that money and they argue so hard for it. That's right. So very generous, but on the negotiation terms, always very tough. But at the end, they're good people because they then treat you as a friend. I can trust you. I can work with you. That's why I'm now treating you as a VIP, and they don't really, then they don't care how much to spend. So, so I'm not sure whether I answer your question, well, but do your homework and gain from experience, I guess. It's about experience gaining. Here. Okay. Last question from me before I kind of open up the, uh, the floor to uh, the audience today. Um, what would be so, I mean, you've already given many, but what would be kind of one last advice that you would have for our student here um, in terms of anything, um, be it you know professional or you know, just kind of personal attitude and whatnot? Okay. One take one one takeaway that is very hard because uh, there are many things that are important, but I think one thing that has been really really very important to me is to have a mentor, to have a mentor that you can trust that you can work with, that the mentor can help you, can man the mentor can lead you to success. You follow him, once you identify the person, you follow him, and, and, and you learn from him. That person is so key, that I don't know who that person is for you, I know who that person is for me, and he's my boss, 
he's been my boss for the last 25 years. Wow. And uh, he's still my boss. And he has helped me so much. He works harder than me. <laughs> but he's my boss, but he works harder than me. Make me feel guilty. He's smarter than me, more capable, and works harder. You sound like a guilty man. I'm you're like, you're yeah. guilty about your boss, you're guilty I'm about your family. <laughs> Guilty and, and, and humble, of course. My, my boss told me, always be humble. Always be humble, right? So, uh, yeah, so I would encourage all of you to look for your mentor. Look for your mentor, and that person, hopefully that person can be with you for the next 20 years. Um, that is my advice. Almost sounds like a marriage. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, any questions for Walter? Come on, Romano. I, uh, <laughs> nah, no pressure, but uh, you know, we want to keep this casual for really anything that you like. We can ask questions of Will. <laughs> no, tonight's about Walter. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you, Walter, for giving us such a great selection. It's been a long time since I last spoke English in NYU. Yeah. And I just graduated from uh, NYU in New York City. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, I decided to go come back to China to work here. Uh, it's, uh, my question is like a follow-up question to your last answer. Uh, is there any um, specific skills or techniques in funding a uh, mentor? I think <laughs> it's usually um, yeah, it's usually uh, like normal for people to think that a mentor is very important, but there are so few like people telling us how to find a mentor. Uh, I think this is the kind of thing that you don't find them. You sort of meet them, right? If you if you being very go out and try to look for someone, sometimes it's I don't know. I maybe will you can share your experience. I haven't really found the person sort of like happened. I was working for him. I was working for it, for him, and I feel that I can learn a lot from him. And I feel that he can he trusts me. I feel that he trusts me, and the working relationship just just went on, and then he became very successful. Of course, the mentor hopefully is a very successful person. <laughs> and then he he then lead me to be successful, and he he would scold at me. I treat him like my father. He he would like treat me like his son. If I do something wrong, he would just be very straightforward and say, stupid, right? How can you do this? You never do that again. Even today, even today, he would still talk to me like that. If you do that again, you, you, you're out. Of course, I would never. So very straightforward. Very straightforward. Um, and, and, and you feel that you can learn a lot from. Uh, usually, that kind of person uh, would appear in your, in, your, in, your, in your company, probably, right? So you just, you said you just, you just came back and you start, have you started working? Yeah, and I'm just at the beginning of my career. So right. I guess I'm very curious about, like, I'm also looking for a network. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, I think probably many people aren't as lucky as Walter um, have been in terms of finding that mentor. Um, I myself work for the same boss, um, I'm also a mentor figure on and off um, over across like four different companies. I follow him around um, and, and whatnot. But I think in your case, probably you just came back into a new environment, perhaps kind of do a little bit of homework, right? To you, You'll hear about people's reputation in your company and, and there are certain people that have you know, stronger reputation than other, and then once you kind of find that person that you do admire and respect, reach out to them. Yeah. You know, um, because often these people have earned that reputation because they they like to help, um, and they are you know enthusiastic about um, bringing other people along. So I think you know that's probably one approach if your company doesn't have a. Uh, like a more formal system, and in, anyway, even sometimes even the formal system don't quite work out as much as the kind of the informal yep. channels and networks. So. Yeah, I have a question. Actually, I graduated from NYU last year and worked in San Francisco for one year and just came back two, two months ago. So my question.
question is, because I'm just new here in Shanghai, so I don't know, how do you really develop or maintain your relationship when you start with zero? Yeah, you have you have to start from zero. Unfortunately, I, I started from zero, and I was your age. So same thing, right? So maybe 20 years later, you will be sitting here sharing your your stories. Um, but um, you you don't you go out, right? You go out and start coming to event like this and, and meet different people and reach out, like what Will said. Reaching out is so important, and try not to be too protective. If you are always protective and nobody wants to talk to you, uh, reach out and, 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 and be open. Be very open-minded. Uh, and and go, to different, go to different events, different functions. There are many social events, uh, and big business events, the American Chamber of Commerce. Of course, you have to pay a membership fee. Um, and hopefully, uh, you can work for a big, a big company. Right? Hopefully, you can find a job in, uh, in a larger company, a bigger platform. Right now, I work in a startup company. Startup, yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's alright, it's alright. I think there are, I mean, back to the question of choices, right? You've made two choices, two right choices now. The first choice is NYU, the second choice is coming back to China. You make two right choices. China is the future, right? I believe so. China is the second big, largest economy of the world. It may become the largest economy of the world if we continue to grow at 6.7% and USA grows at 1%, right? Mathematically, it can happen. Probably not in my career lifetime, but in your career lifetime. And China is a huge market, right? Many opportunities, open-minded. So first of all, the reason I say you make the right choice is I'm not saying I'm not saying you you would you would not be successful if you have if you maintain your job in San Francisco, but I think you being Chinese with a US education and then yourself in Delhi in the back will even have more opportunities in China. Uh, but now the third choice is what company to work for, right? So you're now working for a startup. I think startup company there are many things that you can learn. You get to see everything, right? If you work for Ernest and Young, you see a small piece. You only see a small piece, yeah. right? But uh, with an international platform, so there are there are always pros and cons, and there's no right or wrong. Make the best out of your current job. I think mean, that that would be my advice. Yeah. Hello, hi. Uh, you moved back in class of 2002, so Hello, I'm old. Um, <laughs> I was wondering because you are with Ernest Young, your with a, your primary goal is uh, accounting is your duties. How did you get into the whole consulting side of the business? Mm. Oh, me personally? Yes. Um, well, I, I'm 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 still a tax partner, right? Uh, so my, what I do right now, I would say what I do right now day to day is even more commercial. I'm more and more becoming a business person now. Of course, I still know my tax rules. But I'm, you know, I need to check, right? I need to double check with, with the younger people now. Uh, how did I get into it? I think, I think it just come very naturally because if you work for large companies, you get to see many things, right? You get to work with different many people, see many things, and there are many, many area of expertise. I, I only know a little compared to my whole company, um, and and then that's how I picked up my business skills serving clients, meeting the expectation, exceeding the expectation, making sure that our clients are well, are well taken care of. That's basically what I do right now these days. Uh, yes, I have accounting background, I have taxation background, but, but don't worry too much about what you study. I would say don't worry too much about what you study. Once you join a company, it's a whole new world. It's a, it's a whole new big platform that, that you, can, you can participate, you can learn. So it's really no magic secret other than just maybe IQ, EQ, being, being smart and learn from people around you, really. Stop it, right? Okay. Any other questions? So 
So thank you for coming tonight. And a sophomore and also a mentee of the mentor program. So I have a question for both Will and Walter. Um, my question is, I'm wondering if there's any uh, activities in college or experience in college that helps you to decide or to develop your future career. In college. In college. Wow, well, long time. Long time. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm probably a little bit shorter than yours. <laughs> <laughs> well, you want to? Um, probably, I think it's more of a. Again, this kind of goes back to what you were saying that there's really no right answer. Um, I'm probably a little bit more free flowing. Um, so I think it was just kind of more of an attitude that I. And, and a way of thinking about things. Perspective, I think. A sense of perspective. Uh, perspective. That probably kind of helped me most in terms of um, my kind of career or life. Um, you kind of really have to develop your own personal values, and once you have that, you're uh, even when you try different things, you have that anchor that so that you, you don't kind of like drift and get lost. So um, I think you know for students, current students, that's probably the most important homework that you can do right now is to kind of really find your own values and, and really kind of de define them and test them. Um, yeah, well, uh, in college, I think I spent my college life pretty boring. It was, I was studying, doing a lot of studying, and then I was working a lot. Uh, as I said, I, I didn't really come from a, a wealthy family, so I needed to, I needed to work. So in my free time, we were doing, doing college, in the free time, I, I, I had jobs. I, I, um, and you know all my all my classmates they were participating in this and that, but I, but I had to go to work to make money. But that to me had been extremely helpful too, because it gave me an early start. Right, I was doing all kind of works. I I I, I, I did I did uh, in college. So why my delivery food delivery? I worked for a Chinese restaurant deliver food. Right, <laughs> uh, I was an office boy. Right uh, in the office, I was delivering mails and cleaning garbage. I did that, but then later on, uh, I was selling. I was selling in Chinatown. I was selling martial arts. What a fine life in Chinatown. <laughs> so, but then, oh, then of course, at the end, I was. That sounded a little illegal. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I did all kind of part-time job, and that gave me opportunities to learn many, many different things, interact with many, many different people, and, and that have shaped, helped me shape my personality. Uh, and at the end, you know, uh, work for my company. And, but right now my job requires me to interact with a lot of people, and you have to be a likable person, right? If you interact with clients, I mean, we provide services. We provide services. You can either buy from me, or you can buy from PwC. Or you can buy from KPMG. Why you want to buy from me? I'm smarter. I hope. I, yes, I think I am. But I want my people to be likable. You want to be able to be liked. Oh, I like working with you. I enjoy working with you. And that personality has been shaped because of my diversified working experience. Okay. So I think we will wrap that up for the evening. Yeah, and we have a little token of appreciation that the oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, backpack. Hope thank you can you. travel with, thank you. with them. Please join so me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Stay, there's pizza and the water and will will stay a little bit better yeah, too, yeah, right? Yeah. So if you have any questions then you want to come to them and, and ask them.